The following program is made possible in part by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. We're coming to you from Capernaum in Israel, just on the northern side of the Sea of Galilee. This is the main ministry hub for Jesus. And we want to let you know that we're going to be, over the next three weeks, we're going to be having worship from here in Israel and also in Irvine. And we're so glad you're joining us. Yes, shalom, friends. And this is a very special synagogue in Capernaum. And get ready, you're about to hear about the significance of this amazing place. We've asked uh, Haven to come with us so she can open all of our worship services while we're here in prayer. Um, bow your heads in prayer with me. Dear Lord, I pray as we go throughout this series that we can really just... Um, see the Bible in a new way as we see these places and hear their stories and that um, the audience and us would be able to understand in just a deeper way um, what you want to say to them. Um, thank you so much for providing this opportunity and providing this time we share together. Um, we love you so much, Lord, and we continue to go after you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Turn to the person next to you and say, God loves you and so do I.
In preparation for the message, Luke 4, 16 through 22. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today, the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son? They asked. And I love this. And remember, friend, the gospel is full of liberty, but we must have faith in action to enjoy it. God is a faith God. Faith is just treating the word of God as if Jesus Christ were right there speaking it to you, and he is. And I love the fact that we are right here in a synagogue in the area, the very place that Jesus taught in person as well. And you know, the apostle James says, I will show you by my actions what faith is. I love that. I will show you by my actions what faith is. Yes. I want to be the type of person that does not just read the word or hear the word, but acts on the word. So thank you for joining us today in Capernaum. Shalom. Thank you for being a part of our Hour of Power family. We're so glad you're worshiping with us today. As we continue to recover from the effects of two very challenging years, now more than ever, it's important to take care of ourselves. When we embrace the act of self-care, we can live our best lives and love others really well. Caring for ourselves can be about our physical health, but it's also about slowing down, taking the time to pray, and seeing beauty in God's creation. There's wisdom and spirituality gained in these kinds of activities because they bring us closer to the heart of God. As a part of your self-care ritual, I believe adopting an attitude of gratitude will cultivate joy in your life. Practicing the art of appreciation has the power to transform our lives and our culture. Because Jesus redeemed our struggles and shortcomings, there are countless things to be thankful for. No matter how our circumstances look or how we feel, the Lord is a never ending source of goodness, which means that we have plenty of blessings to count every day. 
To jumpstart your life of gratitude and happiness, we have a special offer for you this month. For your gift of just $25 or more, we'll send you our Faith Soap Dispenser with the words, Faith is not believing God can, it is knowing that He will, boldly displayed on the front. This clear glass dispenser holds eight ounces of soap, hand sanitizer, or lotion. For your gift of just $65 or more, you'll receive our self-care bundle, which includes the Faith Soap Dispenser, a Cast Your Cares candle, and a set of three gratitude journals. The candle, pleasantly scented sea salt and orchid, is made from soy wax, and the set of three gratitude journals includes 64 lined pages to record what you are grateful for. Call, write, or go online to request the Faith Soap Dispenser for your gift of $25 or more, or for your gift of $65 or more, we'll send you the complete self-care bundle. Hannah and I are truly grateful for you and your faithfulness in upholding Hour of Power. Your donations ensure that you and others will continue to be uplifted by our positive message for years to come. Thank you, and remember, as always, God loves you, and so do we. Can't escape disappointment, can't avoid the delay. But I don't have to make feeling down and defeated the place that I stay. Place that I stay. Gonna rise to the moment. Gonna speak to the waves. Gonna push back that doubt that keeps dragging me down when I can't find a way. Can't find a way. Don't need to see. Ronnie, it's great to be here with you in Capernaum. 
A lot of people have not met you before. You've been our guide many times. You're with us the last time we were here, here in Israel. And I have to say, I've been on, to Israel, you asked me, I don't know, maybe 10 to 15 times. And usually it's in tour groups with buses and there's different tour guides on each bus. So you get to see two, three, four guides. You are my favorite. Thank you. And that's why we have you here. You're so knowledgeable. You understand the Old Testament, the New Testament. You're Jewish, but you, you really like Jesus, right? You even believe in him in, in some way. And I, I'd like to ask you more about that without getting too personal, but um, we're so glad to be with you here in Capernaum, the yep. hometown of Jesus. Before we get to that, tell us a little bit about yourself. You obviously have a long history here. Your grandparents escaped the Holocaust, isn't right. that right? Tell me a little bit about that. Well, my grandfather felt that something is wrong in Germany in 1933. So he sent my mother and her brother and sister to Palestine at that time, and he joined them six months later. And the family who left in Germany said that he's completely crazy, everything is okay, it's only a bad wave, things are going to be okay again. Uh, but he wasn't convinced, he left Germany and he came to Israel, and he was the only survivor from his family. Wow. Yeah. Okay, well here we are, we're in Capernaum. Yep. Why is Capernaum so important to Christians and people around the world? Well, first of all, um, I think this is the place where Jesus spent three years. This is his home. This his is home his base. base. Right? Yeah. That's right. This is where, from, from here he goes, here he comes back. This is the place that he picked uh, after he left, uh, of course, Nazareth. He had to leave Nazareth. He couldn't stay there. Mm -hmm. It's far away from, uh, from, from the city of Tiberias, yeah. which is a very hostile city. It's, uh, of course, uh, Herod Antipas, far away from uh, Caesarea Philippi, over there, up there with Herod Philip. And this is right on the border. He feels very comfortable over here. People accept him over here. He becomes to be the rabbi here. So this is his hometown. We picked a beautiful day. It's a sunny 70 something degrees out yes. here. A little warm, but not too bad. There's a, we're at, right here, we're on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. People can't see it from here. Right. Just maybe a hundred feet over there is St. Peter's house. It's right. actually the house of his mother-in-law, right? And then Absolutely. his house and then a church worship there, the early church. And this is what? What is this behind us? This is the synagogue. I mean, it's not the synagogue, the synagogue. from the time of Christ. Yeah. I mean, uh, the synagogue from the time of Christ is going to be a little below us. You know, in the Jewish way of thinking, uh, you cannot build anything on top of what used to be a synagogue. And the early Christian in the fourth century, when they built a monument for the rabbi, they went to the place where the older synagogue used to be, and they built a beautiful synagogue, one of the biggest in the Galilee, as a monument, as a, a contribution for the rabbi who was a, who was a Jew. He was a teacher in the rabbi in the in the synagogue. He was teaching, preaching, and he performed two miracles here. Mm -hmm. So that's why the place is so unique. It's interesting because when you read in the New Testament, you see Jesus is constantly going to all these synagogues around the Galilee region. We're not far from Bethsaida, which is what, that way? Upset, yeah. And Chorazim is just a few miles that's that right. way, important town. Uh, and Nazareth is what, that way? That way. About, but about 30 miles, right? It's yes. a long way from here. But one, one interesting question a lot of people have for me is the synagogue, obviously in the Jewish life in Jesus' day, is so important. But we never see the synagogue in the Old Testament. When did the synagogue come about? And, and why don't we see the synagogue in the Old Testament? Well, we do believe that synagogue started when the Jews went to exile in Babylon, looking for a place to keep their, to keep their identity, to keep their roots. And they, they form a, a, a place, to call it in Hebrew, Bet Knesset, House of Gathering Together. Let's get together, let's keep our roots. And when they return to the land 70 years later, the synagogue is moving with them. Uh, not as a, pr a place of prayer, because there's a temple to pray at, but as a place of gathering together, studying, uh, disputing, uh, explaining, uh, taking the kids and give them the roots. This is going to be the gathering together. Many scholars believe that today that most of the prayers are going to be taken at the temple during the feasts. Yeah. And then here we actually see there's these benches here. This is where the worship would have happened. I was just noticed, I'd never seen this before, but does that say Herod on that pillar? What is that about? No, but on the pillar we have uh, two, two inscriptions. One of them is in, is in, in Greek. And that one is in Latin, uh, the, the one in the Greek, of course, is dedicated to the synagogue and when it was built. And the other one is going to be dedicated to Father Ofali, who was the main archaeologist from the Franciscan who dug the whole area. And he died in a very tragi tragic uh, you know, accident. Er, accident here when, uh, when his car crashed into a column. So those are the two things. But again, again, this is the monument. The real synagogue is going to be right behind us right under uh, the synagogue of today. But this is still a synagogue. Oh, yeah. And this is 
on t built on top of the synagogue uses on. But it's a similar model and plan, right? You have, well, I'm, we're, it's missing some things though. Like I would look for where's the Bema and the Moses seat? Where would the scrolls be kept, do you know? Okay, this is because, you no, know, we have a lot of uh, theories when it comes to Judaism. How does the synagogue from the fourth, synagogue, fourth century is going to look like? Um, we don't have a niche. And most likely the Bible is going to be outside. And uh, that's why we, de we dedicate or we date it to the fourth century. Uh, the bima, there's no bima here because most time, most likely when they built it, it was built for a non-Jewish community to remember there was a rabbi over here. Really? Yeah. This is not going to be most likely an active synagogue. Mm. It was built at the same time when they built the church around the house of Peter, mainly, mainly it's a monument, mainly it's a monument. Mm -hmm. If there were a few Jews over here, most likely they were praying as well, but it was mainly a monument. I'm gonna give my sermon in the room next door. In this room next door, tell us a little bit about that. That's where the disciples, the students uh, would be picked, right? Absolutely, uh, you know, next to every synagogue, next to every Bet Knesset, there's gonna be a Bet Midrash. A Bet Midrash means house of study, and that's where, this, that's where the kids are going to study. And that's when they reach the age of 14, 15, the rabbi is going to one day to get them all together, look at them and point on a few of them, usually five, and he's going to look at them and say, Lech Acharai, follow me. And that's where the disciples are going to be picked. Uh, Jesus picked 12. Yeah. But it's a different story. David Flooster says it's five, and Jesus picks 12 because of the 12 nations of Israel. Exactly. And you can see all this excitement, all these visitors from all around the world. We've seen Romania, Italy, Germany, all the United around. States, D Netherlands, everything. Yep. And it's so interesting that the, the amount of excitement and power there is that we're in the very synagogue, the very place where Jesus had his home base. He picked many of his disciples in this town. Right. Fishing right there, Peter's house right there. It's an amazing place. It is. And what a great thing it is to be a follower of Jesus and come here where it Absolutely. all began. Absolutely. Thank you, Ronnie. We appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Welcome. Maybe I succeeded a little. I jumped up from the floor to the middle. You think I want the credit? I don't.
Thank you for being a part of our Hour of Power family. We're so glad you're worshiping with us today. As we continue to recover from the effects of two very challenging years, now more than ever, it's important to take care of ourselves. When we embrace the act of self-care, we can live our best lives and love others really well. Caring for ourselves can be about our physical health, but it's also about slowing down, taking the time to pray, and seeing beauty in God's creation. There is wisdom and spirituality gained in these kinds of activities because they bring us closer to the heart of God. As a part of your self-care ritual, I believe adopting an attitude of gratitude will cultivate joy in your life. Practicing the art of appreciation has the power to transform our lives and our culture. Because Jesus redeemed our struggles and shortcomings, there are countless things to be thankful for. No matter how our circumstances look or how we feel, the Lord is a never ending source of goodness, which means that we have plenty of blessings to count every day. To jumpstart your life of gratitude and happiness, we have a special offer for you this month. For your gift of just $25 or more, we'll send you our Faith Soap Dispenser with the words, Faith is not believing God can, it is knowing that He will, boldly displayed on the front. This clear glass dispenser holds eight ounces of soap, hand sanitizer, or lotion. For your gift of just $65 or more, you'll receive our self-care bundle, which includes the Faith Soap Dispenser, a Cast Your Cares candle, and a set of three gratitude journals. The candle, pleasantly scented sea salt and orchid, is made from soy wax, and the set of three gratitude journals includes 64 lined pages to record what you are grateful for. Call, write, or go online to request the Faith Soap Dispenser for your gift of $25 or more, or for your gift of $65 or more, we'll send you the complete self-care bundle. Hannah and I are truly grateful for you and your faithfulness in upholding Hour of Power. Your donations ensure that you and others will continue to be uplifted by our positive message for years to come. Thank you, and remember, as always, God loves you, and so do we. Well, welcome to the synagogue in Capernaum. Beautiful space. It's been so great to be here this morning. Such a beautiful day. We've been very lucky and having great weather. And I wish you were here with me. I wish you could see the Sea of Galilee. I wish you could see Peter's house, this village, really a, a large village, many houses, this beautiful synagogue here where people would worship. Right now, we're just next to the main area where people would have worshiped. This is called a Bet Midrash where many of the young students, you know, children and young teens would have come to study Torah and uh, learn and memorize, learn to read and to debate. One of the interesting things about Jesus, of course, if you listen to me speak at all, you know, he's thoroughly Jewish. He's a rabbi through and through. He's fulfilling the Torah. He's fulfilling Moses' law, but also doing something else. His message is not as much about the law as much as it is about faith. And you just hear him say this over and over. This is the thing he's trying to teach his disciples over and over. He gives them this nickname, you little faiths. And he says it in a sweet way. He's not saying it in a condescending way. He's not trying to shame them. He's trying to show them that there's this whole thing that's made available to them if they just believe God's word, if they just have faith, if they just take a risk, if they begin to not just think or believe in their heart or talk about it to their friends, but actually do something. And that proves that they really have true faith. And so we're going to see how this plays today when Jesus goes to Nazareth. It's interesting because when you read a lot of the documents that are around in Jesus' day, you can see that the Jews here around Galilee are in many ways different than the Jews that are south of here in Judea, especially in Jerusalem. Remember that in Jesus' day, there were more Jews living in Babylon than there were living here. And so over the years, 500 years, they began to trickle, sort of trickle back into Israel. And so those who were coming back to Galilee were very often those who came from Babylon. They hadn't been here the whole time. So there was a sort of, we could say, a different flavor, a different tradition to their Judaism. They were still thoroughly Jewish. They were the same. They had the same beliefs. But I heard one guy say that the Jews here were more like a, a little more free-spirited, you might say, a little more charismatic, a little more into you know, the personal type of thing. Whereas in, in, in Jerusalem, you would have gotten maybe a little bit more of a strict Jew. It's a broad stroke, not always, you know, we don't know for sure. But it seems to be that that's, that's going on in Jesus' day. 
So Jesus is teaching about faith, and when he goes to Jerusalem, he's really pressing this idea of faith on the Jerusalem people. Now, if I had a title for the sermon, it would be A Tale of Two Synagogues. We're in the synagogue here in Capernaum, but I, in a second, I want to invite you to the synagogue in Nazareth. We didn't go to Nazareth because it's not the same Nazareth in Jesus' day, but uh, I want you to imagine that we're going there. It would be a lot like, like this place. Now, just a real quick recap. What was synagogue worship like? Very often we're kind of guessing because we don't really know, but it may have looked something like this. The synagogue would have been in the center of town. You walk up into the synagogue because it's the house of God. And you would gather, the men and women actually would worship together at those, time, those times, and they would sing songs, spiritual songs. They would sing the Psalms. We don't know, but maybe they were praying together. But always, 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 synagogue was built around reading the Torah and the Haftarah, reading the scriptures. In those days, you would have a guy that kind of ran the synagogue. He wasn't a rabbi. He was called a chazan. Now, I can't see you, but this is the time you can try that CH sound with the back of your throat. You go chazan. You know, clear your throat a little bit. And the chazan was the guy that kind of took care. He was like a custodian of the synagogue. And one of the things he would do is he would use the Jewish lectionary that was planned in advance. Every synagogue around the whole world all read the same scriptures every single day. You didn't randomly pick a scripture. You had a lectionary. And so on such and such Sabbath, every Jew, whether you're here or in Babylon, Babylon or in Jerusalem, you're all reading the same scrolls that day. You'd have seven scrolls that you'd read. And then typically it would be a member of the community that would read. And they would be picked sometimes three years in advance before they even started reading. And so you'd have this, maybe you could picture a list on the back of the wall. You'd say like, okay, in two years, I'm going to read the scripture. It's going to be my day. Especially um, some of those days would be set around like if you were a teenager, you're 14, 15, 16, maybe you're a teenage boy, you're going to have a bar mitzvah. And so on the day of your bar mitzvah, you're the one who's reading the scripture. So your family's there. Maybe people come in from out of town. You know, you might think of it as like a graduation or, a, you know, baptism or some, something fun like that. So you've got your family and people are all around and you would sit in this bema in a Moses seat and you would be brought seven different scrolls and you would read them all. And when you read them, you would stand and you would read it with passion. You know, you, Jews were all about you know, having fire and passion. They're, they're called to love the Lord with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. And so there'd be this, this fire in them when they read the scripture. And so Jesus, he has this moment, right? He goes into the wilderness. He's baptized by John. He goes then into the wilderness where he's tempted by Satan. And then when he wins this temptation, he comes actually here first in this area to Capernaum, Chorazin, Bethsaida, different areas around Galilee. He's preaching, he's performing miracles, and he's becoming uber famous. It says that the whole region is talking about him. Everybody knows who this guy is. And now he's become like just a, almost a celebrity. Everybody knows who he is. And now it's his day, his turn, to read in his hometown synagogue. So he goes whatever it is, 20, 30 miles that way to his hometown in Nazareth. The book of Matthew says... He lived, this is when he returns from Egypt, he lived in Nazareth to fulfill the prophecy that says he would be a Nazarene. Well, one of the weird things about that is there's really no prophecy in the Old Testament that says the Messiah will be a Nazarene. In fact, Nazareth didn't exist when the Old Testament was going on. So there's a lot of you know, debate about what does that scripture mean? You'll, if you Google it, you'll find 10 different answers. Here's what I think it was. There's some evidence that we've seen uh, from early documents that shows that Nazareth might have been a small town of, say, 200 people. And the 200 people that gathered there were people that believed that their lineage was traced back to Jesse. Why Jesse? Because the scripture says that, in I believe it's Isaiah 16, that out of the stump of Jesse, a shoot will grow. It's a messianic text saying that the Messiah will descend from Jesse, King David's father. And actually, just in the chapter before the scripture we're about to read, Luke makes a big deal by tracing Jesus' lineage. He says, Jesus' father, it was said, was Joseph, and then traces his lineage all the way back to David, and then to uh, Jesse, and then Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and even back to Adam, you know, and says, who, who was the son of God. So there's this, this thing that Luke wants you to see, just like a few verses before this thing I'm about to read, that he is Joseph's son. Who, which means that, you know, Joseph would have been in the line of kings, you know, messianic. So that's a big, big thing. So it might be, we don't know. It might be that those in Nazareth, 
We knew it was a small town, but those in Nazareth were descendants from Jesse because Nazareth comes from a word Nazar, which means a branch or, so you could call it Branchville or Shootville. And so let's go to Nazareth. So Jesus goes and he's, it's, it's his day to, to read. And we know that the people in Nazareth weren't liked very much. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Maybe they were really arrogant because they believed that their special blood or they were special people or something about it. All we know is, we do know for sure, nobody liked them, right? We don't know why. And so Jesus goes back to his hometown of Nazareth and everybody's excited to hear their home. It's like their hometown hero who's become uber famous now has come home and it's his turn to read and to preach and give a speech on the scripture. The Bible says in Luke chapter four, verse, uh, verse 16, it says, he went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue as was his custom. He stood up to read and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And the Chazan, this guy that runs the synagogue, hands him the scroll. It says, when the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, unrolling it, he found the place where it's written. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me. That word anointed, by the way, is messianic. Messiah means the anointed one. To proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the Hazan and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he says, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. What does that mean? He's saying, I'm the guy, I'm the Messiah, I have come. Now, if you've heard the scripture preached before, almost for sure what you have heard is, Jesus says he's the Messiah and everybody gets upset and they say, let's stone him and let's kill him. But that's not true. The next verse says, after he says, today this is fulfilled in your hearing, it says, all spoke well of him. They're excited. And they were amazed at him and at his gracious words that came from their lips. And then they say, isn't this Joseph's son, they asked? Now, when we hear that, we think he's just the son of a regular man. But that's not what Luke and that's what the Nazarenes are saying. They're saying he's Joseph's son. Joseph, who was who? A direct descendant of Jesse. In other words, they're saying, we were right. We knew the Messiah would be one of us. Very likely a lot of the people that were in the synagogue were maybe distant cousins, distant uncles and relatives. Isn't that interesting? Maybe, maybe not. Let's read on. It goes like this. So they spoke well of him and were amazed. Isn't this Joseph's son? And then, but there's this lingering question. We know in Mark, as we read him side by side, that Jesus wasn't really able to perform many miracles in Nazareth the way that he was able to in, in other towns. And it actually says in Mark that Jesus was amazed at their lack of faith. In other words, they had such little faith, it blew his mind. That, that, and and it, to the point where almost limited, it seems like, I don't know, what was able to happen miracle-wise in Nazareth. And that I hope Jesus never says, I was amazed at the lack of Bobby's faith. He might say that, by the way. There have been many times, trust me. You don't want that either, right? You don't want God to say, I'm amazed at their lack of faith. But they were amazed at the lack of faith in, in Nazareth. And it says, okay, so Jesus says to them, because they're wondering, okay, he's the Messiah. Yeah, he's Joseph's son. He's a direct descendant of Jesse. But why are there no miracles happening here? And Jesus is about to give them the answer. He says this, surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. And you will tell me, do here in your hometown what we've heard that you did in Capernaum. That's where we are right now, by the way. Isn't that crazy? We're actually in Capernaum right now. Amazing. Anyway, do what you did in Capernaum. He says, truly I tell you, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, that is the Jewish people, but he was sent to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. Who's that? A goy, right? A Gentile. Jesus says to them, when the people, so you know the story, the, the widow of Zarephath, Elijah pro prophesies against King Ahab, and the Lord tells Elijah, 
go and hide so that Ahab can't kill you. I have more work for you to do. So Elijah goes here and there. And eventually he goes to this, this gate where the widow is. And he sees this widow. She's gathering sticks. And he, sa- he asks her, woman, please go get me a glass of water. She goes to get him water. And he says, oh, and bring me a little piece of bread. I'm hungry. And she turns to him and she says, my dear prophet, I, and keep in mind, she's not Jewish. This is not her prophet, right? She doesn't, probably doesn't know anything about the man. She says, I just have a little flour, a little bit of oil. My son and I are starving. We're going to make one more bit of pita. We're going to eat it. That's going to be our last meal. And then we're going to starve to death. In other words, she's saying, I absolutely would do this for you. But this is all I have left. This is the last little bit I have left. This, is, this will buy us maybe one more day of life. And that's, that is my hope. That's all I have. And Elijah looks at her. And this is chutzpah, right? A good word in Judaism. He looks at her and he says, you make that bread and you give it to me and you'll be just fine. Now she has a choice. She has a choice to say, this crazy guy who's not even from my religion uh, is asking me to do this horrible thing to take the, son, the, the bread I would give to my starving son who's looking at me going, mommy, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. He wants me to take that bread and give it to him and just trust that everything's going to be fine. Or just we can live another day. And guess what she does? She sees this choice. And against whatever, all reason, she believes God. She makes the bread. She gives it to the prophet. And she never hungers again. That, my friend, is faith. So what is Jesus saying here? There are many starving people, but it was this Gentile woman who trusted God that never went hungry again. What is he saying? It wasn't the fact that she was a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It was the fact that she believed God's word and what? Took a huge risk, a huge risk. And God rewarded her for it. That, my friend, is faith. That's not the first thing he says in his little sermon. He then goes off and he says a second example from the Jewish scripture. He says, there was many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet none of them was cleansed. Only who? Naaman the Syrian, another Gentile. Right? Naaman the Syrian was the story as a commander in a, in a foreign army that was possibly belligerent towards the Israelis. They were on the border, we don't know. And this great commander, great soldier had leprosy and he tried everything to be well. And one of his servant girls was Jewish and she said, my Lord, there's this great prophet in Israel, in Samaria. And if you go visit him, I, I believe uh, that he will heal you. And so uh, this commander, Naaman, asks his king, can I go visit this prophet, Elijah? They say that he can heal me. And he says, absolutely. He sends him out, I wrote it down, with this huge amount of stuff. 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, and 10 outfits, clothes, you know? I guess that was a lot back then. And so he goes, this commander, Naaman, goes with this entourage to the king of Israel and says, I'm looking for Elisha the prophet so I can be healed. And what does the king do? He tears his robes and says, oh my gosh, my neighbor's trying to create a war with me. Am I, you know, he said, I'm gonna, can I heal this man of leprosy? Of course I can't. And Elisha sends word to him and he says, king, cool your jets. I got this. Send Naaman my way and I'll heal him. So Naaman, this famous, rich, successful guy, goes another distance to Samaria to visit Elisha knocks on his door and Elisha won't come to the door. He simply sends a messenger. So this, imagine that, this whole array, this horses and camels and gold and silver and everybody's dressed and there's probably flags and banners and, and a royal guard and all this stuff. And Elisha's like, tell him, goes, tell him to go dip in the Jordan River seven times and he'll be fine. And Naaman, so Naaman isn't even visited by the prophets, just like a messenger. Or and Naaman is... I'm trying to look for the word here. Just, a, we'll just say offended. A, just completely offended. And he says, aren't our rivers in Damascus better? Our holy rivers? If, I, if some holy river is going to fix it, it would be those ones. And he storms off with his entree. going, I can't believe I came all the way down here, but all this stuff, the stupid guy tells me to go to the Jordan seven times, blah, 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 blah. And his servant said, my Lord, if he asked you to do something super hard, you would have done it. But because he tells you to do something easy, you won't do it. Just do it. Just see what happens. And so Naaman, even though his ego 
is bruised and injured. And even though, you know, he's kind of been offended, he just does it. He jumped, dips in the river seven times and he's healed. He goes back to Elijah and this time Elijah answers the door and he's like, here's all these gifts. And Elisha says, I don't want them. You know, just the Lord bless you, go in peace. And uh, Naaman famously takes a bunch of dirt from Israel back to his hometown and honors God. But what's the message here? The message is that even though there were people with leprosy that were Jewish, the one that got healed is the one who had faith, not the one who was Jewish. The one who got healed was the one who believed God and acted on it, even though he didn't really like. Belief for Naaman it wasn't really the kind of belief we think of. He didn't feel excited in his heart. He didn't get all stirred up in a worship service. He didn't go, yes, God's going to heal me. He actually went begrudgingly, and, but it bruised his ego even more to take his clothes off in front of everybody and get in the river seven times. He still, it's that he did something. It's that he took a risk to his reputation. The first person was a risk to her, her you know, daily bread. The second person was a risk to his, uh, to his ego. It's amazing how much ego or need for material things gets in the way of us really doing the thing God's called us to do. It gets in the way of us really taking a risk. Don't let that happen to you. It clearly was happening to the Nazarenes because that's the last thing Jesus says. He says, none of the, none of the Jews were healed from leprosy. It was just Naaman the Syrian because he had faith. And then what? All the people in the synagogue were furious. So it's not when he claims that he's the Messiah. It's when he claims that they have no faith. And when they heard this, and they got up, drove him out of the town, took him to the brow of a hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he just walked through the crowd and went his way. That's the power of Jesus, right? They were going to stone him. They were going to throw him off a cliff, a small cliff, so he'd break his legs or back. And then while he's laying on the ground, throw rocks. And he, not Jesus, right? It's not his time. Walks through them. And what does he do? He comes here. Comes here. It says, then he went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee. And on the Sabbath, he taught the people. And they were amazed at his teaching because his words had authority. And then he just begins to do miracles here. The first one is, uh, is uh, freeing a man of, of a demonic possession. So it's interesting, here in Capernaum, Jesus did amazing miracles, they had a lot of faith, but back in Nazareth, no faith at all. Let's be people of faith. Let's be faith, and let us see faith as not something we feel. I mean, that is maybe part of it sometimes, but let us see faith as what we actually do. As, let us see faith as taking huge risks because we believe what's said in Scripture more than we believe what we're seeing in the natural around us. I think of, when I think of faith, I think of like a little girl who's trying to go across the monkey bars and there's her dad standing behind her, but she's scared and she's worried. He's like, just keep going. I got you. That's faith. That's what faith is. It's knowing that if my hands slip or whatever, I'll be fine. And you will be fine. Uh, I have a real life story like this. You might've done ropes courses back in the day. I always kind of hated them. Back when I used to do like missionary trips or like ministry things, they always have these these rope courses, but there is a good lesson in it. And it's really weird if you ever do a ropes course, there are these big like wooden beams that go into the sky and you have a harness on and like a dumb helmet and you have to like walk across this wooden beam. It looks so easy when you're on the ground, but because it's 60 or 100 feet high in the sky, when you get up there, your body kicks in, your emotions kick in. And, and it's great because reason, like logically, everything's fine. You've got this harness on, it can hold 2,000 pounds. Even when I was eating double stuffed Oreos, I wasn't coming close to that, you know? And, and you've got, and so you, you have to walk across this thing, you've got these little cables, and then you have to climb up this pole, stand on top of like a telephone pole, and then jump six feet and grab a, a trapeze swing, and then it like lets you down. But can I tell you, against all reason, when you stand on the top of that pole, everything in you freezes. And there's no reason why jumping from 60 feet would be any different than jumping just off a foot here, but everything in your body says don't do it. But even though you don't feel anything towards jumping or whatever, when you choose to jump and grab the trapeze and half the people didn't do it, my friend, that is an image of faith. That's really what faith is. It's not, it's not feeling like, oh, when I get up there, I'll jump. It's not your emotions. It's do you jump or do you not jump? Do you go or do you not go? Do you take action or do you not take action? That is what faith is. And that's why things like, I think it's fine for us to be wealthy, for example, 
But there is a danger. Wealth or when you have a salary or you have a lot of good things can, can keep you from saying, I want to jump and do this thing. Ego is even worse. When you have a big ego, a lot of pride, maybe you're unaware of it. Just ask your spouse to let you know. You know, maybe if you've got this huge ego, you know, taking a risk for God, if you want to pray for someone or build a thing or, and you know it could really harm your reputation, you could look really stupid or really foolish, those ego things are going to keep you very often from, from doing something faithful f- for God. Very often you see that the people that don't have a big good reputation or don't have a lot of money or a secure job, sometimes they're, it's easiest for them to take big risks for God. But it doesn't have to be that way. You can make a choice that even though I maybe have an ego sometimes, maybe though I'm financially secure, I've done well, I can still risk it all, I can lay it all on the line, and everything will be fine. If I lose everything, it'll still be fine. And that's, I think, the beginning of faith. Remember, when rabbis called disciples, this is like a core principle. When rabbis called disciples, they're expecting that their disciples will do what they did. That's why Jesus says, you will do even greater things than I. I mean, he means that. He means that we're called to be world changers. And it is amazing, those, those 12 disciples who were like older teenagers or college age students, we're all here because of them. Every single person that's watching this video has been an- impacted in some way because of those 12, those 12 nobodies from the middle of nowhere. That is the power of people who put their faith in Jesus. When we were coming in and we were looking at the Sea of Galilee and we were driving this little van, I said to my daughter, I said, look, Haven, there's the Sea of Galilee. There, one of the most important men who's ever lived walked on water. His name was Peter. Yeah, you think you're going to say Jesus, but Peter walked on water too. And everybody says, well, he failed, but he got like, what, six or seven steps. And even when he sank, he kind of sank. You picture him sinking slowly like jello. I mean, that's a lot better than what I did. And I love this story about Peter because... Peter sees Jesus walking on water, and Peter's the one that says, thinks in his mind, I'm supposed to do what the rabbi does. So he says, Rabbi, ask me to come to you, and I'll do it. And Jesus is like, come. And so he gets out of the boat and starts walking on water. So what do we learn from that? If you want to walk on water, you got to get out of the boat. You've probably heard it said before. If you want to walk on water, you got to get out of the boat. You have to do something. You have to take sometimes crazy risks and in order to see God's power and faithfulness. And I want to encourage you to do that. That's why Hannah, whenever she's praying in her miracle services, she'll always say something like, after she prays with somebody, now do something you could not do before. She loves to do that. In fact, one of her biggest challenges right now is what do I do for people that, you know, maybe can't understand me or whatever. She always wants to challenge people to do what they could not do before, to put their faith in action in the prayer. And it really yields a lot of, a lot of fruit. My friend, life is so much of life is about taking risks. And you actually will see in life that when you stop taking risks, your life feels, even though it's safe, it starts to feel boring. And actually the truth is, it's not as safe as you think it is. Your money is not really keeping you that safe. Your ego and reputation is not really keeping you that safe. You know what makes you safer? Is is taking risks and growing as a person through those weird moments that stretch you and pull you, even when you fail, those failings are probably making you more safe than putting your faith in something material. And so I want to encourage you today from Capernaum, Jesus' messages, it's not about your denomination. It's not about how much of the Bible you know. It's not if you went to seminary. It's not if you have some ministry office. It's not your race. It's it's not your denomination. I might have already said that. It is, do you have faith in God's word enough so that you'll do something different? Take a risk today, trust in Jesus, and it will all be different for you. We love you and God bless you. Lord, thank you for your word. We pray in Jesus' name that you would teach us what it means to live with faith in action. Amen. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have you ever wanted to go to Israel and see the Holy Land? Come with us with Hour of Power and me and Hannah as we go to the Sea of Galilee, Capernaum. We see the places where Jesus did his miracles. We'll visit the Jordan River, 
come here to the Masada Fortress near the Dead Sea and even go to Jerusalem and see the place where Jesus was crucified and raised from the dead. It's an amazing experience and we hope you come with us. Yeah, the, truly the Bible comes alive in Israel. It's a trip that you will not forget. We hope you can join us. The preceding program was made possible in part by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you, and is accredited by the Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability.